Good morning and welcome to our online service this morning and a very special welcome to you if you're joining us here for the first time. We're going to be continuing our series of talks on Christian fellowship and Jonathan will be talking to us later on about that. My hope and prayer this morning is that each and every one of us might sense God's presence in our worship, in our confession and in our prayers and that our hearts and minds might be opened to your prompting, your challenge, your encouragement. Well, we start with the prayer or special collect for the fifth Sunday after Trinity. Almighty God, send down upon your church the riches of your spirit and kindle in all who minister the gospel your countless gifts of grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a saviour, the hope of nations. Saviour, he can move the mountains, my God is mighty to save, he is mighty to save. The Bible says that if we claim we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let us now join together in confession. God of all grace, we confess before you this morning, forgive our ingratitude for all you have provided, our impatience with the needs of others, our words and actions that have hurt others, the thoughts that have not honoured you. When we have not sought your will, but our own, the things we have left undone, neglected to say or do, we have all fallen short 
in our lives. You promise to forgive all those who truly repent. So this morning, my prayer is that you forgive each and every one of us our sins, even our sins, that we may live the lives that we proclaim, made right with you through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way as you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your, in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Well, let me add my welcome to that of Julian. And as we now come to think of these verses, uh, let's ask for the Lord's help. Let's uh, pray. Lord God, almighty, our loving heavenly Father, as we now come to think of these verses, as we come to listen carefully to the words of Jesus, please help us to hear. Father, please help us to learn how to be a more and more faithful fellowship. Father, we ask it for our good 
but for his glory. So we ask it in his name. Amen. Last week from Philippians 2, we began a mini-series on fellowship. We saw that the fellowship mindset, the mindset we are to have one to another, is the mindset of Jesus, who valued you and me above himself. He looked to our interests rather than to his own. And that is the mindset, the attitude we are to have one to another. It's a tough calling, but out of it emerges the most beautiful thing on earth. The vibrant, loving, authentic, attractive manifestation of Christ's kingdom, which is what we are in him. With that as our foundation, today we look at going from failure to fellowship, from the verses Ruth just read for us. We're going to think about how we can continue to build true fellowship even when things go wrong in our relationships. The two particular areas of failure we're thinking about are judging others and what we must do when someone sins against us. Let's look at this problem of judging others. Matthew chapter 7 verse 1. Do not judge or you too will be judged. It's a pretty clear statement. But is Jesus really saying we must never judge at all? Well, let's be careful and allow scripture to clarify what Jesus is and what he's not saying here. Just later in verse 6, Jesus says, Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. A little later still in verses 15 and 16, Jesus says, Watch out for false prophets, and by their fruit you will recognise them. How are we to discern who are the dogs and pigs and false prophets unless we judge, unless we make careful distinctions based on doctrine and deeds? Jesus is instructing us to judge what is true and what is false. So Jesus isn't saying we must never judge, but what is he saying? Well, it becomes clear, both from the, the wider context of the Sermon on the Mount and from what he goes on to say here, he says the issue is hypocrisy. And the reason we can be hypocritical is our blindness. Let's look at verses 1 and 2 together. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way as you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Jesus is reminding us when it comes to judging others, the standard is universal. It's not one standard for you and another for me. There is one standard. When we judge someone for gossiping, we declare gossiping to be wrong. And so it doesn't matter who you are. Whenever you gossip, you are condemned. And the principle is true whenever we criticise or condemn, whatever way we judge others. When we see it like this, it's obvious. But why is it so hard to see these things in ourselves? Because, Jesus says, we are blind. Verses 5, 3 to 5. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. We're all prone to blindness. About 20 years ago, I read an article about competence. Research had shown that competent people tended to judge themselves to be incompetent. And rather worryingly, incompetent people judge themselves to be competent. We all have these blind spots about ourselves, our behaviour, our attitudes, words and actions. And so we merrily go around pointing out to others all the ways they are failing while at the same time are unable to see our own failures, which ironically are often glaringly obvious to others. 
I'm sure you've had conversations where someone is complaining about this and that, judging someone, and you thought to yourself, yes, I, I see what you're saying, but you're just the same. We see it in others, but what about ourselves? Through this image, this comical image of the great plank in the eye, Jesus wants to provoke us into a much more humble estimation of ourselves and a much more gracious attitude to others. We're so quick to point out the failures of others that we forget how blind we are. Did you notice in Jesus' image of the plank, the plank is both the sin and the thing that stops us seeing clearly. Our sin blinds us to ourselves and so gives rise to this judgmental, critical attitude towards others. We tend to judge others to feel better about ourselves. We point out their faults and failures so that next to them we look good. But that is a toxic medicine. It's a toxic uh, medicine for them and for us. We're often more prone to this kind of judgmental behaviour when we don't feel good about ourselves, when we have failed or when we're hurt. In whichever situation it comes about, it strains our relationships, our fellowship suffers and we fall short of being the vibrant, loving, authentic, attractive people God calls us to be in Christ Jesus. What are we to do? We need to hear, we need to remember what Jesus is saying. We have planks. As last week, we need to turn to Jesus if we are going to see. We need to humble ourselves, come before him. We need to remind ourselves how loved we are, that we are accepted, valued by him. He died to rescue us. We also need to be reminded of the mercy and grace we have been shown. We are sinners saved by grace, nothing more. As those he saved, does he judge us? No. Then why do we judge our brothers and sisters whom he also died to save? How we need prayer ministry, that the Spirit reveal our planks to us. How we need each other to help us see the planks, to pray with us, so that, as those touched afresh by grace, we can see clearly to help our sisters and brothers, just as we have been helped. Do not judge, Jesus says. But what should we do when others sin against us? We turn to chapter 18 and verses 15 to 17. If your brother, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over, but if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses, everything above board. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church, and if they refuse to listen even to the church, Treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. I think it's wonderful that Jesus, knowing we're not perfect, has given us so simple a roadmap to go from failure to fellowship, to restore our fellowship when our relationships go wrong. And yet, as simple as this roadmap is, even if it sometimes needs to escalate to involve others in the fellowship, the church leadership perhaps, the typical train of events is someone will upset someone else with some harsh words, some abrasive attitude with an outburst of anger. And the next thing that happens is that it is talked about around the fellowship. Jesus is very clear, that is not the way. The truth is, it's much easier to tell a friend, to seek sympathy, to recruit allies, to draw up battle lines than it is to go and speak in humility, with courage and love, seeking to make known the hurt, to reveal the sin and through apology and forgiveness, restore fellowship. Genuinely to apologise takes humility, 
to acknowledge where we're wrong, to seek forgiveness, puts us in the other person's debt as we wait for them to forgive us. To forgive is costly. To forgive means laying down any right we feel we have to retaliate, to make the, the other person suffer for what they have done to us. But again, did Jesus retaliate or did he go like a lamb to the slaughter that we might be forgiven? Jesus has given us this prescription to go from failure to fellowship. How we dishonour him and all he did for us if we gossip, if we don't take full advantage of it to honour him as those he saved. So if someone comes to tell you about what someone else has done, pray with them, support them, but tell them to go and speak to the other person in humility, with courage and love, genuinely to seek restored fellowship. And if someone comes to you to tell you how you wronged them, hurt them, listen with love. If an apology is due, apologise freely, with no but, no conditions. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment this is easy. Some sins wound deeply and the process of restored fellowship can be lengthy. Some sins may require us forgiving time and time again as we struggle to let go. But this is the way Jesus has given us so that we may go from failure to fellowship and so build his body, the local church. As we prepare to meet together, God willing, soon, let's commit to prayer, to growing in the fruits of the Spirit, showing greater love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control, valuing each other above ourselves, that we would more and more be the people God calls us to be in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. As we rejoice in this new day, so may the light of your presence, Father God, set our hearts on fire with love for you now and always. Gracious Father, give us wisdom to understand more, a willingness to seek you with our whole heart, patience to wait for you, eyes to behold you, a heart to meditate on you, and a life to proclaim you through the power of your Holy Spirit. Dear Lord, in these times of uncertainty, 
as lockdown eases and life begins to take on a new way. Help us not to be fearful, but help us to be wise and sensible in the way we choose to start to do things again. We pray that everyone will take responsibility to behave in a way that is respectful and thoughtful, not putting ourselves or others or the country at risk by ignoring government advice and risking spreading the virus again. Please help us to be patient. We pray for all the amazing workers in the NHS who served with deep commitment and loving kindness in the most demanding situations to help save lives and at the same time risking their own lives. We have heard how exhausted many of them are now the crisis is over and how they are left with trauma and deep sadness. Many are unable to take any time off to recover as they are needed to work on the backlog of those requiring operations and treatments that were suspended during the crisis. Please Lord bring them relief and comfort and please heal their memories. We pray for those working on a vaccine that there will be great cooperation across the world as this is developed and we pray shared. And we also pray for the trace and track technology to be available soon in a robust and secure way. We pray for all the businesses that are now starting to trade again, managing the restrictions and providing much needed services. We particularly remember those in the Shepton area that they will be well supported as regular and new customers return and that any financial losses incurred during lockdown will not prevent them trading again. May they be encouraged by our local community visiting the shops again. We pray for the church and especially our own church and those who lead us. We pray for Jonathan, Emma and Zachariah, for Tony and our readers Matthew, Julian, Albert and Jill. We pray for our church wardens, Nick and Vaughan, and Helen, our administrator. All who have worked so hard in keeping the family of the church together and supported, both spiritually and practically during this time. We especially pray for wisdom as they work through the ways of reopening the church and how to hold services in the future. We long for a time when we can worship together again and be with our friends. We continue to pray, Father God, for you to send us a children's and family worker. We ask that you give wisdom and guidance for the way ahead in our search for the right person. Help us to trust that your timing is always right and that you will provide. Lord, we ask you to help us seek out opportunities to work for better understanding and tolerance between people of different religious backgrounds, different social backgrounds, different racial and political backgrounds. And we pray especially that these views will not lead to bitterness and hatred between us. We remember the example of the Good Samaritan who reached out to someone outside his own religion and culture. And may this be an example to inspire us to go beyond our own comfort zones and help and understand those in need, regardless of them being different to ourselves. And finally, Lord, we entrust into your tender care all those who are ill or in pain, asking that you will hold them safe and that you will comfort and heal them and restore them to health and strength through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Well, as we come to the end of our time together this morning, please feel free to join us in the online Espresso Yourself Cafe. And having done that, as we go out into the world, let's pray that our lives individually and together might reflect the light and the love that you provide for us. And let's join together in the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now evermore. Amen.